I too am very happy to be here, actually. This is really a wonderful occasion. Um, <coughs> totally worthwhile. And I was saying um, downstairs, that's bad, um, that the curious thing for me is that a lot of my students I teach at NYU these days um, are not as familiar and obsessed with these stories as I certainly was uh, during my graduate school days in the middle 80s, which uh, I don't understand at all. I mean, uh, I don't want to get hagiographic till I finish reading, so maybe I'll read a little first. I think you established a fine approach, is read first, yak after. So um, I'm going to read a little bit of this story, The Jewels of the Cabots. Now, it is the last story in the collection, and um, it's the stories as you go through them, I'm sure many of you have found, get stranger and stranger as they go on. And perhaps in some ways, none is more strange than this story, which seems to have absolutely no manifest content and a lot of digressive latent content. Um, there's a sort of ostensible story, which is that Mr. Cabot got murdered and someone stole the family jewels but it's never really resolved um, in a tidy, sort of mystery story kind of way. And instead, the story lurches off in very strange directions, uh, never quite coming back. Um, so I'm going to read the middle section. The story actually breaks out in this really arresting um, digression right in the center of it. Uh, that I have read so many times that some of it's probably nearly committed to memory at this point. Um, and I'll just give you a flavor of the absolute structural singularity of this uh, very strange piece. <clears throat> He's walking on the beach with Molly Cabot, right before this paragraph starts. Children drown. Beautiful women are mangled in automobile accidents. Cruise ships founder. And men die lingering deaths in mines and submarines. But you will find none of this in my accounts. In the last chapter, the ship comes home to port, the children are saved, the miners will be rescued. Is this an infirmity of the genteel or a conviction that there are discernible moral truths? Mr. X defecated in his wife's top drawer. This is a fact but I claim that it is not the truth. In describing St. Batalfs, I would sooner stay on the west bank of the river where the houses were white and where the church bells rang. But over the bridge, there was the table silver factory, the tenements owned by Mrs. Cabot, and the commercial hotel. At low tide, one could smell the sea gas from the inlets at Travertine. The headlines in the afternoon paper dealt with a trunk murder. The women on the streets were ugly. Even the dummies in the one store window seemed stooped, depressed, and dressed in clothing that neither fitted nor became them. Even the bride and her splendor seem to have got some bad news. The politics were neo-fascist. The factory was non-union. The food was unpalatable, and the night wind was bitter. This was a provincial and a traditional world enjoying few of the rewards of smallness and traditionalism, 
And when I speak of the blessedness of all small places, I speak of the West Bank. On the East Bank was the commercial hotel, the domain of Doris, a male prostitute who worked as a supervisor in the factory during the day and hustled the bar at night, exploiting the extraordinary moral lassitude of the place. Everyone knew Doris, and many of the customers had used him at one time or another. There was no scandal and no delight involved. Doris would charge a traveling salesman whatever he could get, but he did it with the regulars for nothing. This seemed less like tolerance than hapless indifference, the absence of vision, moral stamina, the splendid ambitiousness of romantic love. On fight night, Doris drifts down the bar. <coughs> Buy him a drink, and I'll put his hand on your arm, your shoulder, your waist, and move a fraction of an inch in his direction, and he'll reach for the cake. The steam fitter buys him a drink, the high school dropout, the watch repairman. Once a stranger shouted to the bartender, tell that son of a bitch to take his tongue out of my ear. But he was a stranger. This is not a transient world. These are not drifters. More than half of these men will never live any other place. And yet this seems to be the essence of spiritual nomadism. The telephone rings, and the bartender beckons to Doris. There's a customer in room eight. Why would I sooner be on the West Bank, where my parents are playing bridge with Mr. and Mrs. Elliot Pinkham in the golden light of a great gas chandelier? I'll blame it on the roast. The roast. The Sunday roast bought from a butcher who wore a straw boater with a pheasant wing in the hat band. I suppose the roast entered our house wrapped in bloody paper on Thursday or Friday, traveling on the back of a bicycle. It would be a gross exaggeration to say that the meat had the detonative force of a landmine that could savage your eyes and your genitals, but its powers were disproportionate. We sat down to dinner after church. My brother was living in Omaha, so we were only three. My father would hone the carving knife and make a cut in the meat. My father was very adroit with an ax and a cross-cut saw, and could bring down a large tree with dispatch. But the Sunday roast was something else. After he had made the first cut, my mother would sigh. This was an extraordinary performance, so loud, so profound, that it seemed as if her life were in danger. It seemed as if her very soul might come unhinged and drift out of her open mouth. Will you never learn, Leander, that the lamb must be carved against the grain, she would ask. Once the battle of the roast had begun, the exchanges were so swift, predictable, and tedious that there would be no point in reporting them. After five or six wounding remarks, my father would wave the carving knife in the air and shout, Will you kindly mind your own business? Will you kindly shut up? She would sigh once more and put her hand to her heart. Surely this was her last breath. Then, studying the air above the table, 
she would say, feel that refreshing breeze. <laughs> there was, of course, seldom a breeze. It could be airless, midwinter, rainy, anything. The remark was one for all seasons. Was it a commendable metaphor for hope? For the serenity of love, which I think she had never experienced? Was it nostalgia for some summer evening when loving and understanding, we sat contentedly on the lawn above the river? Was it no better or no worse than the sort of smile thrown at the evening star by a man who is in utter despair? Was it a prophecy of that generation to come who would be so drilled in evasiveness that they would be denied forever the splendors of a passionate confrontation? The scene changes to Rome. So, um, I read the book when it came out. We were saying this downstairs. My dad got it for high school graduation. I got this book. Um, and my father wrote, Rick, he writes better than you, but keep working. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I read the whole thing from, from uh, Alpha to Omega, uh, and because I was 17 at the time, um, these late stories absolutely confused me in some ways. I, I was still in a period uh, where I expected the story would begin in a certain spot and go to another spot. And then I had my undergraduate years and I went to Columbia for grad school. And in grad school, uh, I took a course in contemporary short fiction taught by Russell Banks. Did you take that class too? You didn't have it the years you were there. It was really an incredible class. We read Welty and Salinger and Cheever and uh, Hemingway, a few other things. And um, Russell cherry-picked stories from this book. And because of where I was in the, in the six years that had passed since I first read it, I had a completely different vision of this book. And what I actually detested this time through were the very realistic John, John Cheever stories. And instead, I had this revelatory experience of the totally unusual, not conventionally structured, odd last third of the book. And this piece in particular rang some incredible bell for me. And I actually wrote an essay about it uh, that was in conjunctions at one point uh, called John Cheever and Indirection. And it's about the idea that um, this story in particular and a lot of late Cheever was um, crypto-autobiographical in the sense that he wanted to tell uh, the world about his life. But because WASP culture is evasive, he could not directly address it in his fictional work. And so whenever he would come close to a sort of gripping, dramatic, emotional moment, he would have to digress. So thus, feel that refreshing breeze in this story becomes a kind of a little crystalline statement of what it felt like to be from his part of the world, which is also my part of the world, um, constitutionally incapable of getting riled up and dramatic about emotional stuff. Conflict's coming, so you avoid, and that phrase becomes the yearning to uh, purge all this pent-up material, but also the phrase that indicates that it can never happen exactly. So um, the late stories to me are laterally constructed, digressive, whenever they're about to close in on what we might otherwise, if we had been reading realistic American fiction, uh, think was the duty of the story to fully dramatize the conflicts between the characters. That's why I liked The Late Achiever, and that's why this story was a revelation for me. I never again 
after I read the story, could write a conventionally structured, realistic piece because it always seemed um, like a failure in some way because I had not suggested how digressive thinking and evasion are bound up in the way that people in my part of the world conducted human affairs. So to be realistic for me is to be anti-realistic according to what we know of from Hemingway through uh, Richard Ford, for example. Um, so that was the revelation of this piece, and I've been reading it over and over and teaching it hundreds of times um, since then, uh, that a looping digressive structure is more honest and more accurate to the way people think than a story that goes A to B to C. Um, very few people agree with me. <laughs> and this is a story that almost nobody reads uh, if they're just dipping into the stories of John Cheever. But it's where he got to late in his career. And if you look at the, the very few things that were published after this book in the way of short fiction, a few uncollected stories, um, they're in some ways even weirder than this one. Um, very uh, allegorical very um, resistant to traditional story structure and often consisting of various fragments sort of assembled in a kind of haphazard way. I think that's what he thought he was, that's the way he thought he was telling the truth at that point in his life. Um, and maybe it had something to do with mild cognitive impairment from uh, decades of alcoholism that he had just recovered from or maybe it had to do with this rich sense of paradox um, uh, and the real complexities of life. I know Susan wants to talk a little bit about the um, Paris Review interview with Cheever, which is great, and there's a moment in it, I hope you're not going to talk about this one too, where he talks about how lies are essential to the smooth functioning of, of human civilization, and they say, give us an example, and he said, why the vows of matrimony, of course. <laughs> what a thing to say. And it's just exactly this kind of paradoxical and, and complicated notion of what human consciousness is um, and how uh, contradictions and paradoxes are hardwired into our identity. I think these later stories indicate that, and that's why I love them. Thanks. follow those two. That's what they said was so good. I should leave it at that. Um, I, uh, I feel like I've, I, I, I agree with Liz, so, so much to say about Cheever or so much feeling about him. And, um, but I'm not a critic. That's not my forte at all. But I love him, and I have a I have the big original book here, um, and it says you know, S A M, which is how I sign all my books, 1978. So that's when I read it, and I, I even have you know my marks of the books that I really liked with a lot of stars, and I think they would get up to seven stars, and um, the the story that I'm going to read, The Sorrows of Gin, only had three stars then, but one, one maybe changes in the stories that you, you love. Um, Rick was also saying before, oh, I, I, looked, I was looking up on the internet to see when this story was written. My, my story is, I think, a little earlier than theirs. It was written in 1953. And um, yeah, 53. And it's, uh, and, and one of the other things that came up um, was something that said, some reading this story and then Rick's name. So I, I went and looked and it was a blogger who said, or a critic, 
is that it's hard not to read this story and think of Rick Moody and his novel, The Ice Storm. <laughs> um, uh, we were talking earlier, and, and Rick said it when he was talking about his students not really knowing John Cheever, he said he would absolutely not be the writer that he is if, if it wasn't for these stories, and I, I, can, I can say that um, as well. Um, I'm going to read just, a, the, just the beginning and the end of the story, and I'll, I'll fill it in a little, which is not what one should do, because really every sentence that he writes is explaining what he's talking about so much better than you can ever paraphrase it. Um, Cheever, this is about, a lot of this story is about alcoholism and uh, the stars of gin. And so he, in 1953, he still had 22 more years of uh, good drinking. And uh, I, I mention that because the story is so, um, there, there are no blinders about the effect of alcohol in it. Um, it is so, profound about how much the disease of alcoholism just permeates into everything. And it's written from the point of view of a little girl. I think it's fair to say the story, though I, I wasn't certainly aware of it at the time, but it very much influenced um, my first book, Monkeys. Um, it would not have been the same book without reading these stories. Um, I, I actually just printed out the, the interview at the, uh, at the Paris Review interview because I just wanted to see some of the things he was saying. And he um, says how he doesn't like to talk about, uh, he's, he's evasive of interviews. And he says, I don't have any critical vocabulary and very little critical acumen, though everything he says in the piece is really very articulate. My critical grasp of literature is largely at a practical level. I use what I love, and this can be anything. So. I'm going to read the beginning. Um, the, the two stories that these guys read were uh, sort of showing how good he was at describing kind of the arc of people's lives or, or um, how things can be told in a, you know, the only word I can come up with is a narrative way, but that's not what I, that, that doesn't really mean anything except that in a sweeping way. And, and this story is very much told, uh, we are just given the play-by-play um, the -play action of what's going on, and he was really good at doing that, too. <clears throat> it was a Sunday afternoon, and from her bedroom, Amy could hear the Beardens coming in, followed a little while later by the Farquharsons and the Parmenters. She went on reading Black Beauty until she felt in her bones that they might be eating something good. Then she closed her book and went down the stairs. The living room door was shut, but through it she could hear the noise of loud talk and laughter. They must have been gossiping or worse because they all stopped talking when she entered the room. Hi, Amy, Mr. Farquharson said. Mr. Farquharson spoke to you, Amy, her mother said. Hello, Mr. Farquharson, she said. By standing outside the group for a minute until they had resumed their conversation, and then by slipping past Mrs. Farquharson, she was able to swoop down on the nut dish and take a handful. Amy, Mr. Lawton said. I'm sorry, Daddy, she said, retreating out of the circle toward the piano. Put those nuts back, he said. <laughs> I've handled them, Daddy, she said. <laughs> well, pass the nuts, dear, her mother said sweetly. Perhaps someone else would like nuts. Amy filled her mouth with the nuts she had taken, returned to the coffee table, and passed the nut dish. Thank you, Amy, they said, taking a peanut or two. 
How do you like your new school, Amy? Mrs. Bearden asked. I like it, Amy said. I like private schools better than public schools. It isn't so much like a factory. What grade are you in, Mr. Bearden asked. Fourth, she said. Her father took Mr. Parmenter's glass and his own and got up to go to the dining room and refill them. She fell into the chair he had left vacant. Don't sit in your father's chair, Amy, her mother said, not realizing that Amy's legs were worn out from riding a bicycle while her father had done nothing but sit down all day. <laughs> As she walked toward the French doors, she heard her mother beginning to talk about the new cook. It was a good example of the interesting things they found to talk about. <laughs> you better put your bicycle in the garage, her father said, returning with the fresh drinks. It looks like rain. Amy went out to the terrace and looked at the sky, but it was not very cloudy. It wouldn't rain. And his advice, like all the advice he gave her, was superfluous. <laughs> they were always at her. Put your bicycle away. Open the door for grandmother, Amy. Feed the cat. Do your homework. Pass the nuts. Help Mrs. Bearden with her parcels. Amy, please try and take more pains with your appearance. <laughs> they all stood, and her father came to the door and called her. We're going over to the Parmenters for supper, he said. Cook's here, so you won't be alone. Be sure and go to bed at eight like a good girl, and come and kiss me good night. After their cars had driven off, Amy wandered through the kitchen to the cook's bedroom beyond it and knocked on the door. Come in, a voice said, and when Amy entered, she found the cook, whose name was Rosemary, in her bathrobe, reading the Bible. Rosemary smiled at Amy. Her smile was sweet, and her old eyes were blue. Your parents have gone out again, she asked. They do seem to enjoy themselves. And the old woman invited her to sit down. During the four days I've been here, they've been out every night or had people in. She put the Bible face down in her lap and smiled, but not at Amy. Of course, the drinking that goes on here is all sociable, and what your parents do is none of my business, is it? I worry about drink more than most people because of my poor sister. My poor sister drank too much. For 10 years, I went to visit her on Sunday afternoons, and most of the time, she was non compost mentis. Sometimes I'd find her huddled up on the floor with one or two sherry bottles empty beside her. Sometimes she'd seem sober enough to a stranger, but I could tell in a second by the way she spoke her words that she'd drunk enough not to be herself anymore. Now my poor sister is gone. I don't have anyone to visit at all. So Amy makes friends with the new cook. And um, when they go to pick her up a few days later after she's gone for a visit to the city, she comes back rather drunk. So the parents fire her, outraged that she would drink on her day off. And Amy decides to start pouring the gin down the, down the sink. But the other babysitter who's hired for her, because the Lawtons are always going out a lot, um, comes and is blamed for the gin that's been poured down while she's gone. So they get rid of that babysitter. There's a big scene. The parents never really uh, listen to what their daughter is telling them, so she decides to run away. Her decision was settled. She had a ballet lesson at 10, and she was going to have lunch with Lillian Towley. Then she would leave. Children prepare for a sea voyage with a toothbrush and a teddy bear. They equip themselves for a trip around the world with a pair of odd socks, a conch shell, and their thermometer. Books and stones and peacock feathers, candy bars, tennis balls, soiled handkerchiefs, and skeins of old string appear to them to be the necessities of travel. And Amy packed that afternoon with the impulsiveness of her kind. She was late coming home from lunch, and her getaway was delayed, but she didn't mind. She could catch one of the late afternoon locals, one of the cook's trains. Her father was playing golf, and her mother was off somewhere. A part-time worker was cleaning the living room. When Amy had finished packing, she went to her parents' bedroom and flushed the toilet. While the water murmured, she took a $20 bill from her mother's desk. Then she went downstairs and left the house and walked around Glen Hollow Circle and down the Aleswise Lane to the station. No regrets 
or goodbyes formed in her mind. She went over the names of the friends she had in the city in case she decided not to spend the night in a museum. <laughs> when she opened the door of the waiting room, Mr. Flanagan, the station master, was poking his coal fire. I want to buy a ticket to New York, Amy said. One way or round trip? One way, please. Mr. Flanagan went through the door at the ticket office and raised the glass window. I'm afraid I haven't got a half fare ticket for you, Amy, he said. I'll have to write one. That's all right, she said. She put the $20 bill on the counter. And in order to change that, he said, I'll have to go over to the other side. Here's the 432 coming in now, but you'll be able to get the 510. She didn't protest and went and sat beside her cardboard suitcase, which was printed with European hotel and place names. When the local had come and gone, Mr. Flanagan shut his glass window and walked over the footbridge to the northbound platform and called the Lawtons. Mr. Lawton had just come in from his game and was mixing himself a cocktail. I think your daughter's planning to take some kind of trip, Mr. Flanagan said. <laughs> It was dark by the time Mr. Lawton got down to the station. He saw his daughter through the station window. I'm just gonna tell you, this is the last paragraph, and this is a, a Cheever-esque, well, they're all tour de forces, but this, this, here's, here's the one in this story. The girl was sitting on the bench. The rich names of her paper suitcase touched him as it was in her power to touch him only when she seemed helpless or when she was very sick. Someone had walked over his grave. He shivered with longing. He felt his skin coarsen as when, driving home late and alone, a shower of leaves on the wind crossed the beam of his headlights, liberating him for a second, at the most, from the literal symbols of his life, the buttonless shirts, the vouchers and bank statements, the order blanks, and the empty glasses. He seemed to listen, God knows for what, commands, drums, the crackle of signal fires, the music of the glockenspiel, how sweet it sounds in the alpine air, singing from a tavern in the pass, the honking of wild swans, he seemed to smell the salt air in the churches of Venice. Then, as it was with the leaves, the power of her figure to trouble him was ended. His goof, goose flesh vanished. He was himself. Oh, why should she want to run away? Travel, and who knew better than a man who spent three days of every fortnight on the road it was a world of overheated plane cabins and repetitious magazines where even the coffee, even the champagne, tasted of plastics. How could he teach her that home sweet home was the best place of all? There's no time in the rest of the story that we go into Mr. Walton's head. Um, we're very much in, in her head the whole time. And uh, the, what Cheever does there is what he does in, in all of his stories. He manages to have this flash of something that's so sympathetic and and kind of transcendent and joyful, and it's just packed deep, deep inside, as Rick was saying, so many things surrounding it that are so damn sad. Mm -hmm. And there's one point in this interview when he talks about, oh, I don't want to have to rifle through everything, but the interviewer asks him, you know, why are your stories? so sad. Oh, I found it. She says about one story. It was a sad story. And he goes, he goes, he says, 
Everyone keeps saying about my stories, oh, they're so sad. My agent, Candida Donadio, called me about a new story and said, oh, what a beautiful story. It's so sad. <laughs> I said, all right, so I'm a sad man. <laughs>